Welcome to the Behavioral View. Hey everyone, would you like to get a CEU for this episode? Listen closely for the announcement of three secret words delivered throughout the episode. Take note of those words and we will tell you where to go to get your CEU when the show is over. Hi everyone and welcome to episode six of The Behavioral View where today Rick Carey and I are thrilled to be joined by Mapi Chavez Askins. And Mapi is a BCBA D and in Latin America, she's referred to as an autism specialist. She is founder and director of Alcanzando, a nonprofit foundation that serves Peru and multiple other countries in Latin America. But she has just a fascinating story of capacity building in an underserved region and just years and years of telehealth experience, which has certainly served her well during the pandemic. So we are really excited to talk about all of those things. Thank you so much for joining us today, Moppy. Thank you. It's an honor really to be with you guys today. Well, before we get started with our designated topic, we kind of like to do a slow open where we talk about things that, that we have found that are either just good resources, they could be behavior analytic or just some sort of uh, parallel to behavior analysis or just fun for self-care. So we decided today that we were going to share journal articles. Who wants to go first? I'd love to go first. All right. What you got, Rick? So I'm working right now. Well, I do a lot of reading and instructional design. I'm, I happen to also be working on a course and I continually keep diving into literature and I'm reading this very cool article that talks about uh, it did a literature review on incorporating systems thinking into instructional design. So instructional design is uh, really important for everyone to understand who's, uh, if you're creating programs, just having a basic understanding of that in looking at other approaches to incorporate into instructional design is really important. So this systems thinking is something that I've been big on uh, for quite some time because it looks at how, you know, the parts come together to affect the whole. And uh, it's just a fascinating article and uh, something I would recommend to many people to read, especially if they're interested in instructional design. What's the name of it? Do you have that? Yeah, it's called uh, An Examination of the Systemic Reach of Instructional Design Models, a Systematic Review. Awesome. What journal is that? That's probably not Java, is it? <laughs> no, this is from, uh, it's called Tech Trends, which is the Association for Education, Communication, and Technology. So it's, uh, you know, you could find some other ID articles in there. Do you find that that is easy to read or is there some additional background that, like, could I read it with no background in systems? Uh you would have an understanding. It would help a lot more if you were reading in that literature. Like if you know what instructional design is, some of this is just going to help help you. But uh, you know, if you're completely new to the area, uh, you know, I don't know how much you get some some out of it, but not as much as if you read a little bit more. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Rick. Have you uh, read the book? Um, you mentioned systems. I think it's thinking in systems. Yes, or have you heard by, about it? Uh, Donatella, uh, Donna, what's her name? Meadows is her last name. Yeah, Donella. Don Donella? Yeah. Or is it Donatella? Maybe? I don't know. Something like that. My yeah. husband just got it. Uh, it was actually a gift for me for Mother's Day. <laughs> he actually got to the book before I did. But you mentioned systems, and that's supposed to be an excellent book. Uh, it's just excellent. To get a good understanding of just thinking in systems and how like you pull this one thread over here, but it also can affect change over here. So. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I'll go next. Uh, I pulled an article um, written by 
some friends of mine, uh, and it's relevant to our talk to talk today. It's called Advocacy, Collaboration, and Intervention, a Model of Distance Special Education Support and Services Amid COVID-19. Uh, the primary mm -hmm. author is Janice Frederick, and uh, co-authors are Ginger Robbie and Valerie Rogers. And I hope I pronounced this uh, woman's last name correctly, Jessica Hizika? Uh, I feel like that's not maybe that baby be correct, <laughs> but she was... Is, Rolls off the tongue a little bit smooth, more smoothly than that. Um, but anyways, it came out in um, the BAP special edition during COVID. And it was, they put together this beautiful um, arrangement package on how to provide services to children who were accessing services in the school district. And then the school just, you know, closed door, shut down. And then, you know, they don't have access to anything. And so this article presents a really beautiful description of, you know, what they did and the package around it. And then it also, um, when you go online, you can download a lot of the resources that they use wow. um, in their, like, questionnaires with parents and teachers and making sure that the learner, like, this would be a good fit for them and, and so on and so forth. So I love um, it when they do that. It's it's, yeah, I feel like I've always stumbled upon a tre treasure trove whenever they're willing to give me all their resources. Yeah, it's so useful. And then it helps the replication of it, right? So it helps mm -hmm. instead of being like, oh, this didn't work. Well, yeah, you didn't have the beneficial resources. You had to recreate the wheel. And so it was, I think, really generous of the authors to, you know, go ahead and, and provide those uh, resources. So. Nice. You know what's weird in science is every now and then, and maybe this isn't science, this is more human nature. You run across some people that want to keep everything to themselves mm. because they think, oh, mm. people are going to make money off this. But what you don't realize, and this is what I've learned through time, is the more generous you are and the more giving you are, the more that's going to push whatever it is you're interested in forward. And if you are interested in making money, then you'd be the person on top of that. So it's it's always strange when you meet people that want to keep everything close and they don't want to share the technology. So I think those authors that you just described are, are being really good citizens of science and helping push things forward. Couldn't agree more. And uh, yeah, I'm right there with you on all points, Rick. A hundred percent. Well, well, Moppy, what did you bring to talk about well, today? Well, um, I actually uh, took a little departure of the topic we'll be talking today, just bringing in a little bit of um, something else I love. I am I'm a big animal, especially a big dog, cat person. I have four uh, dogs of my own, two cats. And um, I run uh, a couple of days into an article that is called The Relationship Between Living with Dogs and Social and Emotional Development in Childhood. And I just always find yeah. it so interesting because, you know, with um, many of my friends even who a single or recently married had dogs and then they had a child and now it was like, oh my God, what do we do with the dog now? And, you know, more and more you see the situations where the, our first child was a dog or our first four children were dogs. What do we do now? And I love articles that look into that relationship and they continue to show, you know, how important it is and what of a fantastic role it plays um, when a child grows up with a, with a dog or a cat. So this particular article, the first author is uh, Jorge Manuel Duenas, and it was published actually in, um, in a journal that can be accessed online, which is called Anthro Zoos. Um, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll be happy to send this in writing so that we can give it as a resource That's to our listeners. Uh, but I just, again, yeah. I just think it, uh, to me, it's always fascinating that area that um, we sometimes discount. You know, what are the variables that are important in, in our children's development beyond what we as professionals provide to them? You know, Rick and Carrie are probably thinking because they are Facebook friends with me and they're probably thinking, oh, no, Shannon's never going to shut up now because my Facebook <laughs> feed is nothing but my doll <laughs> that I adopted during COVID. 
And because my son is going to go away to college, she's my next child. <laughs> but you're right in that she has also bonded with him so much. Now I'm afraid he's not going to want to go to college because he didn't want to leave her. <laughs> <laughs> they are. They're important family members. Mm-hmm. Well, all right. I'm going to, I, I hate I'm going last because mine, I don't know, maybe mine's depressing, but I actually pulled an article from the field of social work and it's, it's called moral challenges when suspecting abuse and neglect in school children, a mixed method study. And it's actually from Sweden and it's in the child and adolescent social work journal in 2020. And if I can just do a little quick aside on this, if there are, um, is there, if there are behavior analysts out there in the world who are working in the world of domestic violence, I would personally love to hear from you. And maybe I could convince Rick and Carrie that they won't want to talk to you too, because this is just one of those things that Um, This particular article is actually about reporting child abuse, but I came to it from diving down rabbit holes in trying to find ways that I can be supportive to a couple of friends of mine who are in domestic violence situations. How am I supposed to be a good friend? And that leads me into the literature on what are services like and what are the responsibilities of therapists who are working in these in these areas. And there's so much gray involved in every step of this, but particularly I'll save the soapbox for for later, particularly in this article, it's discussing why people who are mandated reporters don't always report. Mm -hmm. We usually deal with that by providing additional training on what your responsibilities are and recognition. But the fact is most of us who don't report something, it's not because we didn't recognize it and it's not because we don't know our responsibilities. It's because we're afraid we're gonna make it worse because there's long periods of time where the person who may be the perpetrator of abuse is aware of this, even if it's anonymous, They may not know who reported it, but they know where they got the information. And the concern is that the child's life is actually going to be worse for a period of time after a report. So I don't say that I feel better after reading this article. I just feel a little bit less alone after reading it. And I really would love to see more work in so many areas of that. It's just such a huge problem. They said 25% of adults experienced some form of abuse as a child in this article. So it's, I believe it. It's a, that statistic rises astronomically. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We're all in contact with it quite a bit, either on the, the dealing with the aftermath and the trauma work or, Mm -hmm. You know, just encountering situations that we wish we weren't forced to see in the course of life. So, anyway, pivot from. Yeah, the thanks for going class. last. That was a nice transition <laughs> there, Shannon. Yeah, I didn't make like very much sense. I should have gone oh. first. We could have ended with the up note on the puppies. Um, <laughs> all right. So, Moppy, we are here to talk about telehealth and international services. So why don't you just start us off, talk to us about your background and um, your foundation and what you guys do. Absolutely. Um, Again, thank you very much for for having me here today. Um, I'm very excited to be able to share what um, not only what I'm doing right now, but sort of how we came to this spot. Um, I... um, I'm a, originally a, a teacher, you know, my, my first bachelor is uh, as a special educator specializing in autism. And, you know, through graduate degrees, I got into Columbia University where I ended up with a PhD in applied behavior analysis. And that's how, you know, I sort of started putting together education, ABA, and the work that we do today, which is with young children, either with autism or at risk of autism or at risk of developmental delays. 
um, in 2008, I started what is today Alcanzando, which is a nonprofit organization that looks to bring, you know, high quality research-based resources to families um, in professionals in the field of autism in Latin American countries. We are in South America, selfishly. We started in Peru, which is my home country, but then uh, we ended up and grew to provide services throughout Latin America, Central America, and even uh, in Spain. Um, our goal is on one side to promote awareness about autism, which is still continues to be an issue in many, many countries. So knowledge about autism, about applied behavior analysis, you know, bringing knowledge about the science, dispelling myths about it, and also providing direct services for children. And finally, educating the community as a whole in terms of the importance of these services for children, not only in the early years, but also into the school years and beyond. Um, we are a nonprofit, so our goal is to be able to reach out to all families and, and children regardless of their economic situation, which in Latin America can be difficult. Um, so today, uh, we, like we are going to talk about, uh, we've moved into a full telehealth model, which allows us to serve a larger number of families and a larger number of territory or cover a larger number of uh, the countries and cities. You are doing a lot, and it sounds like for the entire Spanish-speaking world. <laughs> I'm just curious. So um, you talked about a lot um, the awareness work and such. So where 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 are you guys with that in in Latin America? Um, is there widespread acceptance of? services as necessary and, and that sort of thing? Um, when we first started uh, in Peru, um, when we, you know, I sort of packed my bags from being in New York and moved down to Peru, grab, you know, drag the sister with me, who also <laughs> is in the autism field. Um, there wasn't really much uh, there. There the weren't any specialized services for children with autism. Uh, children were diagnosed very, very late. Some of them just were never identified as having um, autism specifically. And they were not um, widespread knowledge about applied behavior analysis. Um, it was more seen as a, as a science that was used for other areas, but not something that could be incorporated into the educational field and certainly the base for services for children. So um, now we're happy to say that that's changed. Uh, certainly we're not where we want to be. There's always more work that needs to be done. But a, a perfect example is that today, um, when you go into almost any country in Latin America to see a neuropediatrician, you'll come out of that appointment if autism is a concern with the note to find applied behavior analysis services. And that is a huge change since 2008 when, you know, kids were not even identified. So to us, that's a huge battle. Um, now it's difficult because there aren't a whole lot of providers for applied behavior analysis services, but it's a start. The parents knowing that, hey, this is what I need. So they know where, where to look at. Um, the big a battle in Latin America is funding because the governments uh, in the different countries are not funding services for, for these children. Um, the public schools sometimes at the school level may have services for kids with disabilities, but there's nothing specific for kids with autism. And certainly in the early intervention uh, years, there there isn't any funding for screening kids, for identifying, diagnosing, and certainly not for providing services. So parents and families. Yeah, I mean, that's, 
I'm sorry. No. Is that true for early intervention across the board or just early intervention for autism? It's really for early intervention <clears throat> across the board, but there are some services in in Peru specifically, for example, for parents who are concerned and want their kids to have sort of like a mommy and me type of programs. They are those type of services from the state, but again, not geared towards, hey, let's identify kids who may have disabilities. It's more the parents bring them in when they're concerned, but certainly nothing autism specific. What is the perception um, in the Latin American countries uh, that you've been working in with regards to autism just in general? So not even the services that accompany treatment, but just like, how are they with just, you know, um, interacting with autistics or, or finding out that your child has autism? Like, what is their kind of, because if, if the awareness is lacking, I imagine then their response to, you know, this somewhat novel diagnosis or children who are displaying, you know, behaviors that are in align with this diagnosis, um, may be quite different than in a community that's more accepting and, and, and understanding and, and creating supports around that. Yeah. You know, um, it's interesting. Um, I'm glad you, you asked that question because that has changed throughout the years. You know, it's very different or it's somehow different of what it was in 2008 to what it is today in 2021. But in Latin America, we still have that large discrepancy between um, people who live in the city and may have more um, resources available to them and people who live in smaller towns where there are not many resources, um, to be in medical, educational, cultural. So even though there is a better understanding as a whole in the whole continent over the fact that autism is a condition and is some, is children with autism are children that can be uh, taught. And there is still in the smaller towns that stigma that this might be a punishment from God, or this is, you know, was mm -hmm. given to you, what happened to this mom because of something she did when she was younger. Right. Um, so even though it's getting better, we still encounter that. And on the other side of that spectrum, we encounter families who are very, very wealthy, who are almost embarrassed or ashamed of that, um, of having a child with autism in the family. So they hide him um, or, you know, just don't bring him to services and maybe find um, a nanny that will take care of them at home so the kid doesn't have to leave the house and nobody has to know he, he or she exists. So unfortunately, we still yeah. have those two extremes. But again, every year it gets better. You know, we see every year we find less of those cases, which is, you know, it tells us that we're going in the right direction. Sure. And how have you taken that on as far as getting people to change their mind if they think that this is, you know, a curse from God or something like that? What sorts of resources help change that mindset? Um, something that um, Alcanzando as a foundation does is we do uh, free webinars open to the community on what some people might consider very ba basic topics. You know, so we have the you know autism myths and realities. We have the you know why not be why don't you have don't have to be afraid of a diagnosis of autism or early signs that the child might have some difficulties in development, or even, you know, basics of ABA. And those webinars, nowadays webinars, pre-COVID, mm -hmm. some of them were yeah. locally workshops, local workshops. Um, but we, um, we open those to the community as a whole. So we don't just advertise them in you know, parents who have children with autism or just for doctors or just for psychology students. We, you know, get the municipalities to advertise them as, hey, this is something the community can do. Or we get, um, we put them on Facebook and on Instagram and every other um, 
media that we can, um, you know, we promote them again, community as a whole, you know, in the schools, um, maybe private uh, clinics or public clinics. The idea is to get the word out, not just to people who may be in touch with autism or with a child with a disability, but so that everybody knows about it. Uh, and that throughout the years, you know, one workshop a month has made a difference. Secret word number one, parents. I think that kind of goes back to what Rick was saying earlier about how generosity pays off in the long run. So, you know, while, you know, you're giving away these webinars and sure it's time and labor that you put into it and then like that hour or however long that you schedule for the presentation, but the impact that it's made on the community directly and then the ripple effect that it has, you know, of everyone improving their awareness on autism and and hopefully then mitigating those cases that, you know, that are sad and scary that you you previously mentioned that, you know, of, of some terrible stigma that comes along with the diagnosis. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, so, you know, yeah, I think that that's, it was interesting because when Rick was saying that, when Rick, you were saying that earlier, I thought about that. I thought, you know what? It's, I guess, mm-hmm. from all the stuff we do for free, <laughs> it pays off. Yeah, it does. It does. Mm-hmm. And it's, and it's worth it. And it's worth to be generous and giving. Mm-hmm. I think that that's a beautiful example of, of, of why we need to do that. Yeah. Don't, you can't do it in all places at all times, but. You know, when you can yeah. But I'm curious because um, I'm sure that there are some other people who noticed a need. And I've been guilty from time to time of noticing a need and just complaining about it. What made you decide, I am going to go back to Peru and I am going to take all of this on? Um, That's a huge, huge thing you did. You know, I think... I to start, I don't think I realized we were taking on this much. You know, I went back to Peru after a while of working in the U.S. You know, I graduated in uh, 2005 from Columbia University, but I certainly had already had years of working in the autism ABA field. And I, I went back to Peru every you know vacation to visit the grandmother or to visit my cousins for somebody's wedding and it was always the case that my family will have gathered you know two or three friends who had a kid who they wanted me to take a look and I think over the years you know I was talk to the kids and talk to the parents and you know help them maybe give them some ideas of things they could do maybe meet with the school teacher and give her some ideas and it sort of added up and I was like wait a minute I keep doing this and I don't really have a place to where I can refer these children to. It's just, you know, can we find a a teacher? Can we find a psychologist? And I got to be in a point in my life where I was like, wait a minute, I am doing all of this work in a country where we don't have all the resources we want, but we have a lot. Meanwhile, my home country uh, doesn't have Mm -hmm. a single place where to send these kids. So, and maybe you can even say that it boiled down to one specific kid who, you know, he was little, he was like three years old, uh, the son of, of, a, of a, the friend of a cousin, and there was no place where this kid could go. And the parents were relatively wealthy, but unless they packed their bags and moved to another country, this kid had no place to go that will be effective um, for to effectively will effectively fulfill his needs. So I think at that moment I was like, okay, we got to you know put on hold whatever I'm doing in, in the U.S. and we're gonna go down to Peru and we're gonna get something going. And it literally at the beginning was we're gonna put on hold what I'm doing. I literally went to the provost of the college I taught and said, can I have a sabbatical year? You know, I'm gonna go get started. This thing started in Peru and I'll be back in 12 months to teach and you know we you know drag the sister with me and she always reminds me that i said six families you know she goes six families you said six and we have like 400 
<laughs> so we, you know, we started little, you know, one, I borrowed like the first floor of what was my grandmother's house and we started it there. And of course, a year later, I went back to the provost of the college where uh, I had a sabbatical <laughs> and said, you guys, I can't come back. I can't, this thing in Peru, it's not six families. You know, by that point, after a year, we would, we were seeing about 30. We were getting phone calls, at least a new family every week, if not more. And more things kept coming in. You know, families from different countries kept coming in. Um, at one point in 2013, um, I was approached by um, a congresswoman and a mom who wanted to push a law uh, for children with autism in Peru and knew of the work we had been doing and wanted our support in helping helping them draft the law and put in really what was needed for individuals with autism um, in our community in, in Peru and got involved in that as well. And I was like, it was never my intention to, hey, let's go and change the law in Peru. <laughs> <laughs> it was, hey, we're going to, you know, give services to six families. Well, you know, and it's it's interesting to me. I think you and I talked about this on the side when we first started talking about you coming on the show, that there are some parallels with services in the U.S. Now, the U.S. is the land of plenty, and we have so much more than so many other places, but we also have pockets, mm -hmm. large pockets of rural areas where services are not as easily available. And as you're talking, I'm thinking about the families I've known who they maybe they didn't pack up and move to another country, but they probably did pack up and move to another state. Mm -hmm. They packed up and moved from their their family farm into a place that they never really wanted to live just so they could be near service providers. So I think a lot of the things that you've done are a good model that, that we can replicate in certain places here as well. So we, um, I am personally really interested in talking about how you have reached into those communities that may be more, more resistant. So mm -hmm. thank you for, for enlightening us a little on those ideas. And Shannon, I think that that's a good transition. So let's talk about your model specifically. Mm -hmm. So if you can highlight for us, know what this model looks like. You know, I know you had a different model before COVID and COVID kind of pushed you into this new model and that you're seeing some great outcomes with it. So if you could, you know, share, you know, share with us and our listeners kind of just an over, you know, bird's eye view of what this model is, and then we can uh, dive in from there. Fantastic. Yeah, so of course. Um, what we do today, you know, we are Still uh, talking about early, early intervention. You know, we serve kids from six months to about five years old. It is ABA based, early intervention, parent mediated. So our, um, our model takes a family in, we evaluate the kid uh, via telehealth. Uh, which includes a conversation with the parents. We actually run an adir with them, and we have multiple conversations in addition to that. And then they provide somewhere between an hour and a half and two hours worth of video of the kid in different situations. We complete uh, what is known as a BOSA, and you know, developed uh, for by the same authors of, as the ADOS, but. The, the, with the intention of being that via telehealth. So we complete that. And beyond that, we watch the child in, in many situations, play, interaction with parents, interaction with their siblings, all recorded by the parents with the intention of giving us the real picture of the child. So based on, on that information, we create a uh, a plan for this child. Okay, what do we need to work on? What are their strengths that we can uh, grab on to? And what are the needs? And not only that the parents see, but that we identify through this um, videos that we're able to watch of them. And then that family goes through what we call an induction in which for a full week, they are going to learn the principles of applied behavior analysis and how to apply them 
to their specific situation. So very, very soon in that week, we move from understanding the theory to, okay, how do I apply it to my specific kid? And of course, that learning doesn't end there. We're going to continue to teach them uh, uh, as their program uh, progresses, as the child moves from one objective to another or needs one strategy to another. But that first week is sort of your intense initial injection of ABA and autism and your child's uh, goals. And then we meet with them either four times a week or twice a week, all via telehealth. And, and in those meetings that are done with one of our consultants assigned to their case, we either meet with the parents and they uh, bring in the child with them and sit and work with the child and show us what they've been doing with them. Maybe they've been working on the child reading a book with them. So they'll sit down and let us see how the reading of the book is going. Or maybe they've been working on the child playing a game with the sibling. So they'll let us watch how they've been doing it. And those sessions will also include feedback to towards what they've been working on, but also maybe next steps. So at one point in those consultation sessions, the child might go do something else with another, with the other parent or with a caretaker, and we'll sit down with this mom or dad and explain to them maybe the next goal that we're gonna work on, how we're gonna do it, we're gonna demonstrate how to do it, and they're gonna end the session with homework for the next time we meet. Um, sometimes that having the child live with them doesn't work out with all families, so it doesn't work out at, for every session. And if that's the case, the family brings in a video of, again, the goals they're working on and together with the consultant, they'll watch the video. And that the videos are great because it allows us to pause and say, okay, see how you did mm -hmm. that? Let's watch it again. And this time, you know, I'm gonna give you some feedback of how I want you to do it next time. So, or, you know, if they're going well, we'll say, look, see what you did right there? That's fantastic. Let's do more of that. So, you know, our sessions are individualized depending on the needs of each family. And also during that session, it gives us as the consultant a chance to take data on the objectives that we're working on with the family. So that data is going to guide the programs of the child and how we change to new objectives or change to new strategies. And, you know, like you had well, met, I mean, Carrie, um, that model used to be more of a hybrid pre-COVID and for some families actually it just meant all life sessions but with um, with that we always had families who were only telehealth because of the geographical mm -hmm. distance and COVID sort of forced us into all be at a geographical distance that was <laughs> we were not able to close so we went full telehealth starting in April of uh, 2020. Has the technology been any kind of a stumbling block for the families? Um, you know, when we started doing the telehealth model, which was not with COVID, which was back in 2012, mm -hmm. you know, between 2008 and 2012, we always wanted to do live. So families were forced to either travel to us or sometimes if we had the funds, we would travel to them. Uh, but with, it was always, you know, more the push of doing live. But in 2012, we started to say, okay, what happens? Okay, this family can come, can move to Lima. And they are in a little town that is, you know, a, a plane, a, a train, and a bus, and then a walk up the mountain. So we're not going to make them come mm. here. We're going to, let's try to connect. What can we use? And at the beginning, we were using, you know, something like WhatsApp, you know, whatever video phone we could manage and then we started introducing skype with some families we could do skype so we did that and then we discovered zoom uh when nobody else was using zoom you know so we um, it's so funny because when we started working with zoom we had like a rep that we were able to get the, that to that rep within like five minutes if we needed him you know when COVID hit it was like three hours 
three days. <laughs> no rep. Yeah. No rep. <laughs> no, rep. You're not rep anymore. <laughs> no rep. Just a machine. Uh, but, yeah. you know, at one point, I think it was 20, it was either 2013 or 2014 that we found Zoom. And we started teaching families, um, you know, how to use it. But again, you know, we will give the link and they would be like, what is this? How do we do it? So there was a whole, you know, session that was used to learn, to learn how to use Zoom. Um, we still have families who, who Zoom is not a possibility for depending on where they live. Um, in some cases, yes, technology has um it has been difficult, um, but I have to say, and um, we talked about this um, in a previous conversation with you guys, that uh, COVID in a way was a blessing because it sort of pushed the use of technology forward like 20 years and two months. And people were forced to learn, countries were forced to make it more available uh, in areas of the country where they were not before. So for us, the last year and a half has shown that technology um, could have improved and improved very quickly in, in the countries in Latin America. Yeah, I was so just what you're saying. Oh, oh we did, we're doing it again, Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just thinking as you were describing how um, the family's getting the videos even, right, of, of what's going on that takes some practice and some some expertise of where to put the camera and you know how many cameras do you need and and can the therapist even hear what they need to hear as far as verbal interactions going so it, it there's certainly a learning curve i'm sure there is a learning curve and i think we are more and more conscious of that with every passing month or every passing year so in 2012, it was very much like, okay, whatever the family knows, that's what we'll go with. And by 2014 and 2015, probably, we had a specific time dedicated to teaching the family. Okay, this is where you're going to put your phone or you're going to put the phone and let her run and then come into the area with the child so he doesn't even know you're recording. Uh, we were more aware of the need to, to have, okay, in this session, we're going to learn about how to use the Zoom. Or in this session, we're going to learn about where to position your computer so we can better see the session. Um, or how, you know, like now our videos, um, when we send the packet, the first packet to the family about sending us those first hour and a half, two hours of video, it's very specific as to, where we want you to sit, it, you know, in regards to the camera, where we want the toys to be, how many toys we want you to have out when you do this video versus this video. So with the years, we've learned to be more and more specific and to save time to cover those logistics of the video and the telehealth. But that's something that yeah. for us came way, way before COVID. So um, when COVID hit and we had to take on a whole lot more families via telehealth, it wasn't such a shock. We were ready. Yeah. Yeah. You had the, you had the platform all ready to go. I think, you know, based on how ABA is delivered and especially in the States, how, you know, insurance didn't really fund telehealth only, you know, really the motivation to do that was COVID. Um, you know, a lot of practitioners out here were like, uh, I don't know, find, find a good place for the camera. You know, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure, yeah, I mean, I'm sure it was a little bit more purposeful than that. But in relation to, you know, the years that you had under your belt and had really fine tuned that process, you know, I'm sure that perspective of looking at, what everyone else is doing is scrambling and just kind of trying to make the pieces work was, um, was a bit interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Like I remember, yeah. um, you know, it, when we started doing it in, you know, 20, 2012, 2013, I remember some of our consultants like laptop in hand running around the physical center that we had trying to find a spot. Where can I meet with this family? And they, you know, they're connected on Skype at that point with the family and they're walking around finding, looking for a corner. You know, now right. by 2014, we had designated offices and 
you know, we had the setup with, you know, the microphones in the right places and the light in the right places to, to do that. So we just simply had to replicate that more times for more and more consultants to be able to do the telehealth model. But yeah, That's I remember those brilliant. days. <laughs> yeah. I had a question. Uh, moving back earlier when you were talking about data, you certainly have the video mm -hmm. that you can access, but do you teach the parents to collect data in other ways, like where they're counting yeah, things? Yeah, you know, we, in terms of data collection, we use um, the thread, the application thread, uh, to collect data, which is actually a very easy app to use. So, yes, um, with the, our main source of data are our consultation sessions. And so when we meet with that family those four times a week or those two times a week, that's when our consultants collect, collect data using thread. But for some families, we do teach them to do it, you know, and sometimes it, the families knowing that that's what we're going to do, they're like, oh, well, can we do that as well? And we're like, yeah. And again, easy app to use. So some of our families do collect data, but in those cases, we also collect our data just to have also that inter-observer agreement piece. Um, but other ways too, like there are things we're not going to be able to see in those sessions. So if we're toilet training, we certainly teach the family how to collect data on, for those right. programs or <clears throat> sleeping issues. So we do have them, you know, we go through a session, of, okay, this is the purpose, this is the goal, these are the, the observable behaviors we are gonna be looking at, and this are, you know, these are your data. Um, and they, we give them, you know, like the spreadsheet for them to collect on, or, you know, here's your printout, or we send them through, you know, a PDF form that they can either print or filling online. So we, we do try to ind individualize it for each family, for each program that that family is really running or really that each goal that they're working towards. Do you have any guidance that you guys kind of go by? Like, you know, I do a lot of school consultation. I need to start saying past tense. I did a lot of school consultation <laughs> and, um, you know, the, the, the idea of getting the same sort of data from the classroom teacher that you're going to get from the behavior therapist who's in the room is just, that's unrealistic. So we just had a, a short and simple, make it as easy as possible and only collect data that you absolutely 100% have to have. Don't ask them to just do things that, you know, would be nice to know. Exactly. <laughs> so did you guys have any kind of plans for how you, what kinds of data you ask them for? Yeah. Well, we try to ask, their families for um, the minimal, the, the data that we're not going to be able to see in our sessions, like mm -hmm. sleeping yeah. uh, times or um, toilet training data, because of the kind of program we run, in, which is 100% parent mediated and 100% interfaced with their daily activities. We want parents to be teaching their children when they're sitting down reading a book when they are helping them get dressed in the morning, when they're giving them a bath at night. So throwing in their, you know, their phone with their thread app, is really not that realistic. You know, there might be a couple programs in which they can do that, but in the large and the bulk of the objectives they're working on, they are, you know, mixed in with their daily activities or they are within their daily activities. So we ask them for a minimal of data and the bulk of the data is collected by our consultants when they're either watching those videos with the parents or they are watching the parents live work with the kids. We much rather say to the parent, okay, I wasn't able to see him playing with his siblings. I want you to put the camera in the playroom, start, let it run, and then just bring the kids in and start playing. I don't care. Send me 45 minutes. I'll, you know, cut the pieces and fast forward to the pieces I want to see. So we might try to have that than um, them collecting data because Shannon, just like what you said, the data they collect is not necessarily going to be a true reflection of the data that the behavior analyst would have collected. 
and not because they don't want it to be. It's just they are in the yeah. situation. They are the parent. They are trying to do a thousand other things. That's right. That's right. Secret word number two delivery. One thing that I think has been a really good secondary benefit from this, and, and I think it's a secondary benefit maybe of two unfortunate things where you don't have funding and so you, you don't have as many rules that you have to abide by. And we had the COVID uh, situation. But what I hear when you talk is true dissemination of ABA. Mm -hmm. That's what I hear. And the way that you have integrated your services into the daily life of the parents so that they have skills now that they can implement coming up in the future, you know, as the behavioral needs change and such. So I would love if we could continue to have that sort of carryover, but... Carrie Millico, I worry <laughs> that in the United States, with all of our rules and with all of our mm -hmm. payment structures, that our providers can't do something as useful and logical as what Moppy is doing. Yeah, you know, there are some restrictions around funding. Mm -hmm. uh, because of the codes and because now of telehealth. Mm -hmm. So as of June 30th, a lot of funders have removed the option of telehealth yeah. to be um, yeah. to be an option. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, the world is opening up. And so they kind of went back to business as usual, which is unfortunate because what I was really hoping for was that we had this great stretch of time. And what I really urge our community to do and hopefully they collected data in a systematic way that they can do this. It's just then, um, and Mappy, I believe that you have uh, mm -hmm. an article coming out that's looking at this, is that saying like, here's what we did in person. Mm -hmm. Here's what we did via telehealth. And what I would love to see is that like, I believe your, your facts showed it was even maybe better. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, what I would like to see is that like, we're still doing great stuff. And even if it's marginally, like with some, um, you know, our clinic did telehealth for a little bit and we saw it dip down for some of our learners, but even if it's marginally less, is that even better than like, okay, not receiving services because we live in Nevada yeah. and we have a, about two cities, right? The rest of it is pretty rural. <laughs> it's got tumbleweeds all over it, right? It's, we're in the desert. And so a lot of people out in these small towns that are sporadic doesn't mean that they necessarily, you know, no people live there without a diagnosis. No, I mean, like, there's people out there who need services, but then either the BCBA has to drive all that way. So you have to find an agency that's committed to yeah. that type of thing or an RBT that lives close by, but then that means distance training. I mean, it gets to be kind of um, a logistical mess where this, this setup, if telehealth can be, we can find a, a formula and it seems that Moppy has where telehealth can be equally as um, producing outcomes as center-based, you know, for a particular set of learners, yeah. um, then let, let's, let's go down that avenue and then we can have the data to suggest to funders, hey, y'all, look at this, um, you know, this, this still is um, an adequate thing. I remember when I was talking with Medicaid about, because uh, I was on the licensure board out here during that time and we were pushing around their uh, release of telehealth so they wanted they wanted details around codes and why this code and what is the proof behind this code being accessed via telehealth model. They want they want data mm -hmm. to make those decisions. Yeah, and I think that that's what we need to provide them as a as a field. We need to show up with our data. We had a year and a half to collect it. Let's show mm -hmm. up and show them that this uh, is an effective model for a certain group of learners for remote um, families, I think it's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. And just, and also the, the idea of it being parent mediated mm -hmm. and more, more support for that too. And I know Rick, you, you've been in some conversations about the, the importance of parent inclusion and in services and such. So 
I'm just hoping that this is going to be embraced on a more widespread scale than it has been in the past. Yeah. You know, just today I had a meeting and I can tell you that the funding sources are more and more looking at that parent involvement. Mm -hmm. You can, it, it's just something that when you marry the, these two, think about Teladoc. That mm -hmm. is uh, Love not going away. It's getting increasingly more popular. And here we are where you know, the services that we're giving isn't like, hey, what are your symptoms? Okay, do this, and then you're going to move on. But still, it is part of healthcare. And being able to successfully show that this particular intervention is having this effect and it's bringing the parents in. And as you were saying, Carrie, we can help all these people in these remote places. And in Moppy, what you're doing, it's the same thing. I, I, I just can't understand how, you know, this isn't something that we're going to accelerate in our field yeah. because it solves so many problems. And, yeah. you know, I've mentioned this in a previous podcast, so I just got to bring it up again that, you know, I do get concerned if we're looking to have the parent replace the RBT because a parent should be a parent. And like here, I, you know, I have three children, uh, none of them as of now, I know have a, you know, um, a disability, you know, they, they haven't gone through, you know, all the testing in school, but you know, right now, right. Everything's looking kosher. Uh, but three is still, you know, get, gets you tired by the end of the day. And even though I have a cushy job where I'm at my computer all day in my home and I'm very privileged and, and having uh, a husband that supports us and does these things, I still look for that alone time. Yeah. I crave it. I need it. Because if not, I'm going to be cranky the next day. And then I'm not going to show up being a good mom, being a good employee. And then you add on to this a therapist, right? And so, um, you know, Moppy, what type of protections do you have in place with your system to make sure that the parent um, is, you know, isn't completely burned out and is still successful and they have all the supports that they need as well? Um, and that, you know, it's not like, you're going to be RBT during this whole 30 hours. And then, and then you have to do all of your parenting duties as well. And then like, good luck getting any rest, you know? So, yeah. You know, Carrie, I am so glad that um, you mentioned that because that since, since we started talking even about the telehealth model, because at the beginning, the telehealth model was for those families who were in remote areas where they there wasn't even a possibility of an RVT. It was, you know, there wasn't, right. there wasn't anybody who could help them beyond maybe the, the nanny that helped them at home or, or the person that helped them around the house who could take the kid on for little bits of time. So the reality was that the parent was going to have to carry out a lot of this interaction with the child so they could learn those skills that we were looking to teach. So we started building on one side, the, given the family the basis of, of the science to, to work in these goals with the child within their everyday interactions with the child. It wasn't, hey, let's add time that you interact with the kid. Let's set up from four to six. You're going to sit and work on these goals. It wasn't like that. It was very much like, okay, tell me about your day. What does your day look like? In you know, what does the, the day of the child look like? Oh, okay, so this person dresses him in the morning. Okay, we're gonna teach that person what goals to work during that time. Oh, and then I come in and have breakfast with him. Fantastic. We'll teach you then what to do during breakfast to promote language. And okay, somebody else has them at three o'clock. Okay, that person, we're gonna teach them, you know, display skills to teach the child. So we build in those teaching interactions what we call the learn units, we build those learn units in within their everyday interactions with the kid. An important piece there, it was that it wasn't one parent working or learning how to work with the child. It was anybody who comes in touch with that kid. 
So grandma comes on Saturdays, well, grandma is going to learn how to have this interactions with the child to teach them the skills you know the nanny that has them two hours in the afternoon she learns as well so that was you know those two components were important but a third one that we added in recent years which we think is crucial is something that we call escuela de padres which is six modules of aba based of an aba based program for to, for the parent as a person, not as a mom or mm-hmm. a dad, not as a person who's going to teach their child new skills, but as a human being to learn to have that me time, to learn to look at things in more of a, I don't know, positive way, how to deal with those things that life throws at you, not necessarily related to the child, not necessarily related to the child's, you know, condition, but more of giving them those um, it, uh, tools to deal with life mm-hmm. in a better way. And we find that that's crucial. It's not mandatory that they do it, but it's mm-hmm. strongly encouraged that they complete the six modules in which they'll learn about how to take care of themselves. And I think all of that, all of those pieces together allow for this, the programs under our model to be very effective. And Carrie, you mentioned, uh, and you know, Rick, you also mentioned the importance of the data of, okay, let's bring the data to the table and help this um, funders see that what they will fund is effective. And we have uh, an article submitted for review at the moment that looked at the same kids, the same kids that were receiving services in a center-based model pre-COVID. We took the data of the um, three months before COVID, and then we took Mm -hmm. the data of the three months um, when the countries closed down and they were under full quarantine and the parents switched to the parent mediated model. So we took the data from those following three months and we compared um, gains of the children. And we did see that the kids at least gain as much, the majority of the kids gain at least as much. Some of them gain more skills under the parent mediated model and obviously there were a couple that we saw did not do as well Um, but then you have to start looking at those variables okay what variables were present in the families whose kids did not do as well and what variables were present Mm -hmm. in the families who did even better so i think those data are important to look at because they should guide our decision there then as to and have you started teasing that out any yet do you already we are tips for us yeah we've already we've already started working on looking at some of those variables and now latin america has not gone back yet to you know life or back Mm to you know normal so we continue to provide services to a hundred percent of the families via telehealth so we haven't been able to you know, do that other comparison again, but we are working in identifying variables of the families whose children continue to do well. So, okay, so what characteristics do we see? How many people are from the home are involved? Um, is there another underlying issues, another variables at play with families? Because we actually had one family that there were a lot of other issues not related to the child, not related to to the kids' uh, needs, and we had to ask them to take a break. We were like, okay, let's yeah. pause. <laughs> You're going to take care of these issues, and then we're going to come back to the table and talk about um, the, the his current needs. And, you know, Carrie, I, I do appreciate you bringing that up about all of the demands on a parent's time and such, but... Also, I mean, the majority of my life has been focused on kids from school age all the way up to retirement home. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, 
<laughs> and so the thing is, once they age out of services, it's right back to the parent doing everything mm -hmm. that's going to be done anyway. So if they can get those skills earlier on when the, the child is smaller and the, and the behaviors are, are more manageable than they get, um, I definitely, I, I don't have the, the data to spit out about this, but just anecdotally, it makes such a huge difference. Oh, sure. it's just, yeah. And, and, and on all levels, not just the outcomes of the child, but for the parental stress and, and sibling relationships and everything. It's just so much yeah. better. Yeah. I just wonder, sometimes families may not just be in the position to do that. Yeah. You know, yeah. when the kid is, you know, it could be like the mom's working two jobs, maybe she's a single mom. And, you know, yeah. like there's so many, when we uh, opened up our clinic, we were working primarily with Medicaid families and before we, and we were in the homes before we opened yeah. the clinic. Um, and, you know, there was um, a lot of situations like that. And when we went to clinic based, you know, it allowed families to like the, they were, um, you know, we had one family that they they didn't have a job or two families that didn't have jobs at all. You know, having the child come to the clinic and receive services allowed them to focus on getting a job. And, you know, another families went back to school. So, I mean, I, I think that there's, you know, definitely some complexities here. But one thing, Moppy, that I, I was thinking of, again, with cultural differences, mm -hmm. Um, and parent training and stuff like that. Again, so I've I've had a lot of parents be like, "Now nah, I'm good. You just uh, you just do your thing, and uh, you know I, I don't need to meet with you weekly. I'm, we're good, you know." And then, um, so it, do you find that parents? I mean, because I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but Latin communities are more community based as opposed to being like individualized. Yeah. Um, as a culture. And so do you find that you didn't have to do much convincing or, or your, um, the parents involvement or like, and, and the grandparents involvement and, you know, the, the nanny or, you know, just like how you said you train anyone, yeah. the, like you didn't have to do as much convincing and pulling and as maybe we experience here in the States. I think culture plays a huge role in the success of a parent mediated program. Not that it wouldn't work, you know, in, in the US or in, in other countries, but in Latin America, it is very much a community uh, life. So it's very seldom that you find just a mom, a dad and a child that live isolated from the rest of the family. They might have their own apartment or their own house, but the house is never uh, habitated by three people. <laughs> there is always <laughs> a fourth, a fifth. The grandmother's always mm -hmm. visiting. There's a nanny that comes in for a couple hours. The neighbor is over. So the the changer, uh, the the game changer for a lot of families in terms of buy-in into the model is the minute that you said, "I'll train anybody who comes in touch with the child," and then they're like, yeah. "Okay." Yeah, because they, some parents might think, oh, it's just going to have to be me as the mom. And we're like, no, who else sees them? Who has them at 8 o'clock? Who has them at 10? Who has them on the weekend? Mm -hmm. And the minute you mention that, there's your buy-in. And you have anybody. We had, like, literally the neighbor train because she comes in <laughs> in the afternoons to watch the kid. So so you do. You, it's very much a community uh Families don't live far from their grandparents necessarily. Um, so the grandparents get that much involved. Uh, and the families get excited about how well the kids are doing. So then somebody else wants to be involved, you know, because they took the kid to go yeah. see the aunt. And then the aunt is like, oh, my God, he's doing all of this. I want to be part of this, too. So I mm -hmm. think that in Latin America um, plays in our favor very much so. I'm, I'm glad you're publishing that because I recently had the the joy of reading all of the published research on parent training via telehealth in the past 10 years. And that was one of the things is that there was so much focus on identifying one parent to collect the data on and this one parent did everything. And that was certainly a weakness is that there, although some of the studies obviously involve both 
parents and sometimes even siblings, but the majority of what we know has to do with all of it being rested on one person's shoulders, yeah. which isn't realistic. No. And that's not, not. see huge responsibility for a parent, you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. that's, that's just a lot. And especially yeah. if they're also have all those other responsibilities, but you know, um, your community presentation, you know, how you're, training up the community around this learner, I think also contributes to the dissemination that you're doing with the work um, in these communities. So it's not that you're just teaching one person about, you know, how to interact with autistics and how to, um, you know, what ABA, you know, is and what it looks like and stuff like that, but you're, you're training a team and then think about the maintenance and generalization of those skills with the learner gets access to this team. And then now these people can then talk about all this and they, and so you just multiplied your impact yes. in the community, uh, which I think is pretty powerful. And, and, you know, uh, it is just, uh, pre-COVID, you know, when, you know, people are going to church on Sundays and they're going to the right. park and on during the week, we involve other members of the community as well. You know, we have, you know, Sunday school teachers that have learned about how do I engage the child into my class. We've had, you know, preschool right. teachers um, attend our workshops or requests. Um, that we come into their yeah. preschools and help them gain the skills. So you're right. It's a, it's a community based that service in which now all of the people that come in touch with this individual are prepared to be spaces where he can learn and where he can use the skills he's learning. Yeah. You say that nope. it's a parent mediated model. And I feel like I want to call it a community mediated model, you know, with all of the good stuff that we're doing with the free webinars and everything like that. Like, you know, you are providing supports strategically around the learner's environment to make sure that they are supported in any way possible, even if it's just by this is what autism is. Don't be scared of it. You know, let's dispel these myths, you know, and, um, and embrace this human. So I think like, I like, I like community intervention, community wide intervention. I um, I you, Carrie. <laughs> Go for it. Cause I think it really in, incorporates all of the pieces that you're doing, um, which is so much more than training a single parent. Now, Moppy, uh, speaking of, you know, the community base, I've been dying to ask you this question. In our field, there has been a debate that has been around for a very long time. And, you know, this debate, you can see this starting back, uh, like when Jack Michael was the president, and then he, he talked about, as a science, we need to be very careful of the, our technical language. We need to be able to, uh, remain and, and many people have talked about how important that is to remain technical so that our terms are sharp and it always means the same thing. The other side of that is, so Don Baird, the year after that was elected the president and he talked about being able to share our technology with other people and, uh, talk about our science in ways that are going to communicate to the consumers. And there's always been this debate talking about, well, you know, on the one hand, the, let's say you're, you're working with parents. Should you always use our technical terms and communicate it in a way that is how a BCBA or an RBT would understand it versus the other side? Uh, you want these parents to be able to understand what they're doing and maybe not necessarily have the full understanding of, you know, the technical uh, nature of some of the terms and some of the concepts that they're using. So my question to you is, how have you approached that? Which side do you come on when you work with your parents and, you know, how has, how have you been most effective with them? You know, we've heard that, um, that, that, that debate, you know, and that, um, those exact same words. Secret word number three, service. 
it's, you know, don't lose the science because then people will just, you know, not understand really what they're doing. But the other risk that that we found ourselves when we were like, okay, we're going to use the technical terms was that, you know, if you look up the technical term, the definition you might find is not what's meant to be from an ABA perspective. So what we do is we use the vocabulary of the science, but we very much explain it to the parents. So we might use the word man when we say, okay, look, our objective is going to be to teach him to ask you for what he wants, which, you know, we might call a man, but what we mean is, and we explain what it is. And in subsequent meetings with the parents, in our conversation, we might talk about asking for what he wants, but our paperwork, which they receive a copy after every meeting, says the word man and maybe a slash and asking for what he wants. So we do build in the vocabulary in it and we make it purposely a situation in which we will use the vocabulary with them. Um, and you find it that that way you're, you know, sort of netting, you know, building into your everyday interactions with them, they begin to use it as well. And then you find them that they're very proud when they use the terms that they've been <laughs> hearing as use. But we always accompany by the description of what it really means. You know, we never expect them to just be talking about, oh, so now he's manding. We're like, we expect them to say, now he's asking for what he wants, but they'll see it in their written paperwork that we call it a man. Uh, same thing when we talk about establishing operations or reinforcement. You know, we very much make a point of using the word but explaining it as well, or vice versa. We explain the word and then we say, well, we call it this. Uh, we do the same when we do uh, community webinars, when we do presentations for um, uh, neuropediatricians or pediatricians or teachers. And I remember the first time we got um, a note back from a pediatrician, neuropediatrician and his notes included the word learn unit and we were like oh my god somebody listened to what we say <laughs> they're beginning to use the language um but to us it's important that it doesn't get lost that people understand it's a science that it's not just something that mappy and her team do uh we certainly don't take credit for hey we made up this strategies uh, but we also want them to feel comfortable that they understand and, they, and that it's their own, that what they're doing. It's not the, I'm not doing this thing Mappy tells me to do. I'm very much doing this that I understand why changing these variables or, or, or presenting things in a certain way are going to result in a position of skills by my child. I don't know if I break that answer or did I went on a tangent there. <laughs> <laughs> very practical and uh it's very pleasing to hear i don't know that there's an absolute answer to that question even though people debate it but it sounds like what you have done through your approach has been a way to maybe take a little bit from both sides mm -hmm. and my take on it is we have a science and however we can make that science work best is what we should be doing. Yeah. I agree with that. And I find the challenge is more in the language area, more about words that appear in both vocabularies. So, you know, when we're using punishment, punishment and, and even the terms positive and negative, having to reteach yeah. what that means is, is a bit of a challenge, but I do think it's well worth our time. Um, Moppy, I don't normally speak for other people, but I think I'm all right to say on behalf of Rick and Carrie, we have really enjoyed this talk with you and we thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks for watching this episode of The Behavioral View. To get your CEU, follow the link in the instructions below. You can then go to the attendance verification quiz where you'll enter in the secret words and pay the CEU fee to generate your certificate. You've already done the work, you may as well get the credit.